Please welcome Pedro Pina. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks for being here. I know it was not the easiest trip, um, but we're, <laughs> yeah, we're glad you made landed. it. Um, so it's, uh, it's a big film. I don't mean long, but I mean big in the sense that it contains um, a lot, and I think it really is trying a film that tries to do many things. So I think I'll start with a big question. Um, I'm just curious about what drew you to making a film about work, about the absence of work, about the meaning of work, um, because it's it's a really kind of interesting subject in the history of cinema. It's a it's a subject that I think has has remained quite in, quite invisible in the history of cinema. I think Harun Faroqi had this famous quote where he said, "Most films take place in the part of life that um, work has you know where work has been left behind." But he also pointed out that the very first camera uh, in the history of cinema was pointed at a factory with the Lumiere brothers. So this project was born uh, from a collaboration that I had with George Silvamello. There is an old uh, theater director and he wanted to, to adapt to cinema a play that he did about a factory that uh, is, is going to close. And it was a musical play made by Judith, er written by Judith Erzberg, a, a, Dutch, a Dutch woman, sorry. Um, <clears throat> And so uh, he, he asked me to adapt the, the theater play to cinema. I started writing with him. And at a certain point, he had uh, his question, his, some problems. He couldn't get on with the, with the project. And it happened in a, in a time when, uh, the, where there was a particular situation in Portugal, the, the crisis, the austerity, period. Uh, I think you all heard about it. And it was uh, a, a time where there was lots of uh, unemployment and lots of factories closing. And uh, we seemed to reach at a, a turn point somehow in, the, in our history, where everyone started to ask what sense does this make, no? What mm -hmm. sense does this economical system make? What, what sense does it make to center our lives around labor when you don't need labor anymore? Yeah. And there was something like 30% of young people unemployed. And so I would never do this film myself if it wouldn't be that particular circumstance and if it wouldn't uh, fell on my hands mm -hmm. by this collaboration with, uh, with George Silvamel. But as it happened, uh, we and me and uh, my colleagues at Terra Trem, we, we assumed it and we tried to, to think it collectively and to write it collectively. And all of us, we come from the documentary, so we decided to, to move to this uh, north district, uh, north part of Lisbon. It's a, an industrial district, an industrial region. And uh, we decided to start speaking with wor uh, industrial workers that ha were unemployed. And they, they, their lives had totally shift and tot were totally uh, unbalanced and destroyed by this situation, the poli political and econo economical crisis. And uh, we, we, that struck us a lot because we, we faced a very dramatical situation, like uh, from the uh, 57 factories that were uh, working two years before in that region, only 11 left, and now maybe there are six or seven left. <laughs> and uh, so there are lots of people that were totally lost, right. and uh, their families were lost, and like people committing suicide, uh, heart attacks, so all kind of stories we couldn't imagine. And so we decided at by hearing these people, we were making like a casting for actors, but at the same time we were uh, hearing stories to to write the, the script. 
And uh, at a certain point, we decided, well, we cannot do only a story of a factory that closes. We have to put ourselves inside the story and make, propose somehow a reflection uh, on the moment we are living. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only these workers, but we ourselves as filmmakers and as part of this uh, collective that yep. is uh, this group of countries that suffered this process. So this original um, idea, original play, was about a, a factory that's closing. Yeah. Um, at what point did you decide to make this a film that's beyond that, but like a film about an experiment in, in self-management? That which is based on an actual factory, as we see in the, uh, in the, cr in the, in the closing credits, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, since the beginning when we started wor uh, writing it, this, this, uh, this play, uh, in the in the theater play, the workers discover uh, a product. They start producing a product. There is nothing, and this product, nothing, becomes very popular. And they open shops of nothing and restaurants of nothing. On the, well, and this it, this works very well in a in a theater play because you don't have to to you can say this is nothing and everyone believes. But in, in film, it's, it's, it works a, a bit different because you have to f film it. <laughs> you have to show it. And it is very difficult to show what is nothing. And at the same time, we, we, we wanted to, to represent this uh, feeling of impotence and this idea that we felt that we were lost without a project without an, a narrative that could help us face the, this new situation in the 21st century. So this kind of nothingness was somehow this, the process of, of, um, of discovering a new, a new uh, narrative, a new discourse, a new experiment that could lead us somewhere. And, uh, like we felt somehow that we were uh, our heritage, our political and philosophical heritage that came from the 20th century was no longer useful to to deal with these new problems. So we felt or or orphelin. I don't know how do you call it in English. Or, 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 orphelin. Orphans. Yeah, orphans. <laughs> somehow, yeah. Um, as you pointed out, you have a, a background in, in documentary. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about just the, the balance of, of fiction and, and documentary in, in this film and how script, you, you, you cast a lot of non-actors? Non yeah, most of them are non-actors. And um, how much of this was, was scripted and how much of it was developed in collaboration with the actors? And, uh, and well, everything was scripted. We. We wrote everything, include, including the dialogues, but we didn't show the, the script to the actors. So we had lots of conversations and we had like two or three months of preparation for the actors, but we didn't, uh, we didn't re re rehearse the scenes. We made like, we tried to simulate uh, some uh, dynamics that were similar to the scenes, but we didn't rehearse the scenes because I wanted to keep the the, the thing fresh, and uh, I wanted to play with surprise and with spontaneity, and then with improvisation. So, at the beginning of the day, I briefed the actors, and uh, in, in uh, collectively, and I briefed the, them individually. And uh, I'd say, at a certain point, you say that to that person but the other person wouldn't know. So I tried to create those kind of dynamics and, and also planted some things in the middle of the action. We, we, in, this, uh, in the shootings, we, abolished, we didn't use the action cut scheme. Mm -hmm. we were, we, they didn't know when we were filming or not. We were always filming, even if we were using 16 millimeters. So we had only 10 minutes long shots available. 
but uh, we tried to because it was very difficult there were so many actors it was very difficult to reach a certain energy and then uh, i couldn't stop it once i get i got there so uh, yeah um the thing was to everything was written but i was trying to make them by themselves arrive there and mm -hmm. and then and i and also i could discover new dialogues and new right. dramatic uh, um, questions that uh, I couldn't imagine when I was reading, right. writing, and so, yeah. Um, I'm curious about the character, um, this, uh, the guy with the hair, the uh, sort of agitator, f eventually find out sort of filmmaker character who um, it becomes kind of the, the mouthpiece for a lot of the more intellectual sort of ideas about labor and, and capital and like can was this figure in in the play or can you talk about just in introducing this figure sort of on the at first on the sideline of the action and then he becomes sort of more more central to it and you know sort of pushes the action in a certain direction no this figure wasn't in the play uh, it, at, it appeared at a certain point when George Silva Melo uh, said uh, I don't know how to speak about these problems in this time of Christ, where there are, there are many people unemployed, how can I speak about work, where people when people are suffering so much about this, and he wanted to put himself in the in the film, and then when he le when he left the project, we we wanted to keep that presence, and somehow as I told you we felt so struck by the the conversation with the workers that we wanted to to introduce our presence in the film and to introduce this uh, perpendicular movement to the to the drama to the re to the things that are happening in the uh, in the in the factory so daniel in calcaterra this ca his character is a way of ourselves to introduce in the film and to like our our look and our reflection on that reality mm -hmm. to be present and this character made this possible to also to navigate between uh, different uh, tones and different yeah. kinds of uh, scenes like uh, the discussion, the very direct and theoretical discussion that we wanted to put, like a, it's a, gr a Greek chorus, mm -hmm. no? Like uh, the 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 gods that speak about the drama of the characters down there, and they we wanted to 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 pass through there, and we wanted to pass through the musical scenes, and the the character of Daniele. Uh, introduced some strangeness in the film that allowed us to to go from one place to another yeah. in a, a more harmonious way. And he's a he's actually a filmmaker, right? Yeah, he's a documentary filmmaker. Yeah. In fact, he was a teacher at the Les Ateliers Varin in Paris for Tiago and Lenore and Luisa that w wrote with me. Okay. Um, this, I guess the most sort of intellectual of the scenes in the film is that long dinner table discussion. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about how that scene came about? Was that, was that entirely scripted too? Or? No, w that was not scripted at all. We, um, we, well, it was scripted as a scene, but mm -hmm. not the dialogue. Not the details. Of yeah, uh, we invited these people that we knew already their positions about these things. We invited Anselm Zapp, it's a German, German French philo philosopher that speaks a lot about the end of work. But mostly I invited f uh, friends of my parents that are from this leftist background from the revolution, the reincarnation revolution in Portugal, and uh, some friends of mine as well. And all we wanted from this scene is that uh, to have present in the table the very uh, concrete uh, words of uh, facing to face the problems 
that the f film was 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 about and and to get to a um, a feeling in the end of the scene that okay we understand everything you were saying we understand everything you were saying even if they those things they annulate themselves somehow but in the in the end we wanted to leave that scene with a feeling of okay and so what <laughs> and what is what can we make with this yeah uh, almost nothing <laughs> or uh, we need some something more we need to go further and um not not discarding the th those uh, those ideas, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, realizing somehow that we need to to find new ones as well. Do you think the ending of the film maybe provides that? I don't. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think that the ending of the film says that even regarding the complexity of the things that are, that are in the table and that mm -hmm. that are played there we have to experiment s something and uh, this idea of experimenting and uh, uh, trying to do something even if it's complex even if it has it if it fails uh, even if it has enormous f fragile fragi fragilities uh, we have to experiment and we have to try on on, on doing it. Mm -hmm. but i'm very i was very struck and actually very moved by one of the last scenes with the two men uh speaking and sort of listing things uh can you talk about how that scene came about when they were talking you know when they're going back and forth with the list of things yeah that scene it's a quotation of uh, mm -hmm. Cecilia Straub. Yeah. yeah, and it's it seems it's the, to it's the, it's the ending of that film too, right? Uh, no, it's not yeah. the ending of the film. It's it's the scene where there is this guy that the has knife the, uh, the, the knife, knife sharpener sharpener. Yeah, it's such a beautiful scene in, Ceci <laughs> in Cecilia, um, and it's, it's it's sort of. Uh, um, concentrates all the beautiful things in the world and all the things that words live for mm -hmm. and we wanted to somehow to finish the film with this idea yeah we are surrounded by shit yeah. but we have to keep on living because there are beautiful things around us as well and I th well that's why we put it there. Um, can you say a bit about your decision to, sh to use 16 millimeter? I think you've done your documentary work is also you've sh you've worked with 16. Yeah, I I have a very difficult relation with digital because uh, of its hygienical and look and technological look, and all my my teaching of my learning of film and all the films that I've seen when I was uh, growing up and when I was starting to love cinema uh, were in film. So for me, it's very difficult to pass from one media to the other. I don't like it. I don't, uh, I don't discard it, but, but I, I prefer the film, the texture and the, the image of the film. We can open it up to the audience for questions. And yes, we have microphones uh, right here. Well, um, thank you. It was great to see, to watch this film today. For me, I'm from Brazil, and we're living a very, very hard uh, moment right now. And it's great to, to have this scene, this reproduction of the scene of, of Cecily in this film since uh, it, it's almost like the feeling that I think a lot of people in Brazil ha are having it right now of everything is awful, but we have to somehow manage to keep going. So thank you for this experience. 
and I would like to ask you a little bit more about the. You, you mentioned how you worked with the with the actors and the characters on on the daily basis, but I would like to understand a little bit more about your work with Vasco and and the camera. How how the camera would uh, work on this environment, especially since, as you mentioned, you you were filming in 16, so you have this uh, limited uh, amount of time to to work and. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's so it's so organic that uh, it almost felt that you had several cameras to to capture everything that was was happening uh, in front of you. So, if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I worked in with Vasco in my previous fiction film. It was a medium-length film called <coughs> Um Fim do Mundo, and uh, we, it was that that time was the first time I worked with this DOP. And in the first scenes that we shot, I was so uncomfortable because we put the camera and I was like suffering because I couldn't uh, move the camera <laughs> during the shot, you know? I didn't want to make the camera myself because I want to take care of the actors, but I had to feel the movement of the camera during the shot. And in the first scenes, I was very uncomfortable because there is this uh, gap between the director and the DOP that you cannot tell them during the shot, well, to do something, you know, it's very difficult. But at a certain point in this like second day of shootings, I started to grab Vasco and to like to dance with him and and in the beginning for him it was very hard because he, he was he felt a bit violated by me because like the director <laughs> <laughs> shaking him around <laughs> and uh, but and when he saw the the result of the film he really liked it i think so uh it was a conquest for me that in the beginning of this shooting he, he had the trust in me already to 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 allow me to to do this. So, me and Vasco and the focus puller, we were always the three of us in the scenes, inside the scenes. So the idea was to to launch the the actors and the to and the energy and to and then it. We, I used to play with this because I, we always said that it was like some kind of some kind of rodeo, like rodeo, like you like you do it here in in, in America and in Brazil as well. Like you you throw the bulls, and then you try to control the chaos and dominate the chaos. And the camera was a bit like that. You no, know? you you th you you create the situation. And then the camera makes part of a situation, and that I think I I got this. I learned this from documentary, the fact that you don't look only to what's happening in front of the camera. You look all around, and you you ha you have the ability to to search where is the good look, and where is the good dialogue, and where is the in, in the middle of this chaos. And that's how we work with Vasco all the time. Um, I'll just repeat the question is whether you shot the script chronologically. Uh, I tried, yes. Not, uh, not always because some, sometimes we had the production issues that couldn't make it, but I tried. Also because the actors didn't know the story, so f to allow them to understand what's happening, it was very important to do it chronologically because this way they knew what had, ha had happened before and, and they didn't know what would happen in the future. First, I want to comment on how fascinating the movie was and how much I liked it. Uh, Thank you. But as, but I may have a few quibbles here. I mean, in the United States, for example, 
before a manufacturer can close a factory, there has to be six months' notice, which is usually starts with a six months' severance pay. In other words, they close right away, but they pay six months' severance pay. And the other piece that I saw was a, a bit different or unusual was the lack of any significant role of the trade union in this. I mean, there's a lovely scene with the labor lawyer, which I liked a lot, uh, but the union doesn't seem to have any role in this process. Now, is this, that Portugal is that much different? Was this some artistic, some degree of artistic license? Uh, could you respond to that, please? Uh, uh, concerning the first part of the, of the question, I th well, in Portugal there are laws the, that are supposed to, to be followed by the by the administrators of the enterprises and but they are not always followed the many many situations like this occur like the um, the, the the bosses of the companies uh, when they want to uh, to move to another country sometimes they they steal their own uh, machines uh, to skip Above these uh, these regulations and to these laws and to to disappear and then this way they 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 declare bankruptcy they don't have they say we don't have nothing we don't have nothing to pay our creditors the workers and uh, all the other creditors and this happened a lot in Portugal and situations like this really happened a lot during the crisis where the workers realized the the bosses of their uh, companies were stealing everything that was inside the factory uh, regarding the unions there are two characters that belong to the to the union um, but we in in the process of writing we wanted that the 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 hero the protagonist and the antagonist of the film were the workers themselves and the drama is between the workers and we didn't want so we wanted that the administration uh, disappeared really soon in the film and we didn't want to give a particular role in the drama to the to the unions and the the, the, the unions are there, but uh, but they don't have like a very important dramatical presence, uh, and this is not very distant from what happens in Portugal. In fact, sometimes sometimes there are uh, companies that are more uh, do, there are more workers that are syndicalized uni unionized but many of them are not. Oh, I wanted to ask what the future seems to be. Is there any kind of uh, tech industry or modern industries? And the second thing I want to ask is... Do you uh, have a sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you uh, is there a future in Portugal? I mean, are they moving into other industries, like a tech industries or... And the second thing I want to ask you is, do you have a distributor for this wonderful film? Thank you. Well, I start for the second question. I don't have a distributor in in the U.S. Only Mubi. It's an online platform. Um, unfortunately, uh, and uh, in uh, in Portugal now, following this period of crisis. Now there is a the, the economy is going up again, but mostly based on tourism. There is a there was a political shift. Now there is the very a very left government. It's a socialist party uh, supported by the extreme left, and this led to a to a very to a, a feeling of hope. That, that contaminated a bit everyone, but uh, but the the main problems, the main structural problems remain like they were before, even if the economy is growing. 
So we, um, we do have to wrap it up, but just to conclude, I wanted to ask you maybe, I think it's fitting, um, that's given what the film is about, for you to talk a little bit about, you mentioned um, Terra Trim and the collective that you've founded, co-founded and are part of, and um, you're actually involved in two other films that are in this festival. You were a writer on uh, John Africa by your colleagues, Philippa and Joao, and you were also one of the producers of Valerie Massadian's Mila. So can you talk a little bit about how this collective came about and how it works? Just Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, The Nothing Factory was the, the, the biggest uh, project that we made since the beginning. And it, I think we wanted to reflect a bit the, the problems that we live in our lives as a film collective uh, and the discussions that we, we have. This is a, a collective that was born in 2008-2009 from uh, six uh, young film directors and one producer. And we wanted to, to start to produce with the small means that we had, with small budget, and start making films with some urgency. And uh, yeah, we, that's what we did. Uh, we helped each other in the, in the crew. Like I would make the sound for someone and the cameras to someone. And we grew, we grew a lot and now, uh, in nowadays we make a lot of films and we have a, a quite an important presence in the Portuguese panorama and um, and that, that's it what, I can, <laughs> what can I say all right um, Pedro thank you so much for thank the film you. and for thank joining you us yeah. thank you all.